Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. I'm Alexander Mantura from Nawazheim. For those who may not be familiar with us, Nawazheim develops cutting-edge technology solutions to streamline key maritime certification processes related to ship clearance, marble, seafarers training certifications, and bunkering. Our goal is to transform the maritime industry, improve lives, and accelerate the sector's decarbonization. This edition of the Navigating New Waves webinar series features Ms. Maritza Oka, founder and president of GOLD, the Gregorio Oka Leadership and Development Foundation. Ms. Oka is a lifelong maritime welfare advocate leading welfare programs for the Associated Maritime Officers and Siemens Union of the Philippines, AMOSU, the world's largest seafarers union. During this session, we will explore the importance of leadership in the maritime industry during this bucket, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and digital times. Our session will be moderated by our co-founder and chief executive, Anjan Borwankar. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that you can share your questions and comments via the comment box. And now, without further ado, please let's welcome Anjan Borwankar. Anjan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alexander. Thanks for that introduction. I'd like to already call upon Marisa Oka. So, Marisa, if you're there, it will be nice to see you. Wow, you're looking wonderful. <laughs> Hi, Hello. Marisa. Welcome. Hello. So, I'll just do a brief welcome to our guests who are connected here from all over the world. The last registration, I'm just going through it right now, it's more than 88 people from over a dozen countries. And I believe some of them are friends that I know who are who may be actually sailing. So they may be in international waters and, and connecting or will receive this webinar later. So, so thank you all for this interest in, in the topic of leadership in maritime. And uh, we have a fantastic, I was going to say personality. She's more than a personality. She's, a, she's an icon, uh, Marisa Oka. And uh, of course, the title says she's the founder and president of GOLD, uh, the Gregorio Oka Leadership Development Foundation, Inc. That's the organization name. Uh, but she wears many, many, many hats. Okay, so, so my job is to try and eke out stories from her about her experiences and and hopefully we'll learn a lot of things from this okay so again a reminder to the audience that uh, you can submit your questions anytime we, we want to have a conversation with marisa i'm going to moderate the session i'm going to take some of your questions and bring it in front of her uh, so 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 be active in that sense okay so so don't hesitate to ask of course, I have the last word on choosing the question, but I, I, but I intend to be, uh, you know, quite open and, and accept all. So Marisa, again, welcome. Thank you so much, Anjan, uh, for uh, inviting me to be in this uh, webinar series. It's really my honor. And um, I really don't know why you chose me, but I'm glad you did. Yes, we will. We will let the audience decide whether the choice I made was was correct. <laughs> but having now known you in a few settings, and we have the privilege of meeting uh, a few times already, right, in the mm -hmm. Philippines, and and to get to know you a little bit about also your family history, the work that you're doing. So I, I think I, I've not made any errors here. Okay, so so let let me begin by. Um, maybe taking you to your childhood days, if that's okay. <laughs> and, and so what influenced you very strongly as a child? Because I guess some of that has led to you creating gold. But mm -hmm. if, if you would like to just, you know, tell us a little bit about your childhood uh, days and any, any story that comes up that really influenced you strongly. Well, uh, well, I can't depart my experiences from my experiences with my father and seeing him at work, you know, and how he had uh, uh, started from a really 37 square meter office to what uh, the Amosuk is right now for the Filipino seafarers. So um, I remember uh, a few times when uh, my exposure to the peers um, uh, I was uh, um, brought by my father 
I think I was about four years old. And it was so clear to me. And I still remember it at this point in time. We had this, like, uh, we call it an owner Jeep. And it's like a stainless steel uh, Jeep from the uh, form from the war, World War II. And he had that as his vehicle. And he brought me at the age of four in the middle of a storm because he had to check those riggings and the moorings of the ships uh, in the pier so that they don't, you know, like uh, snap out in that big storm but that was really still very clear to me it's still very clear to me so my the peers were my playground really like from school we would go pick him up and uh and then while waiting for him i would uh, that was my my hangout so the peers were very familiar to me it was a really great place <laughs> and that's also where I, le I learned to drive so I could weave my car when I finally was able to drive through all those trucks and all those uh, huge vehicles coming in from the uh, piers. It was fun. Well, that that explains how you got into maritime. I guess you know you were you were basically born into uh, you know the maritime industry, <laughs> and 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 again in your case you you just embraced it, right? So it's been something oh, yes. that's very natural for you. You've not even thought about you know. You didn't really join Maritime. It was part of your life from day one. Well, That's Anjan, <laughs> as a, a young person, you know, as young persons would be, you would, I I had some, um, you know, I had some resistance to joining my father at work. And I was saying, I had the privilege of uh, studying abroad. And then when I, I came back, uh, instead of staying over, uh, abroad so uh, i had the 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 heartstrings were pulled me back really uh seeing my father and the way uh, the hard work he was doing and the help he needed to um to build what he has built um drew me back home yes so so maybe for those who are not familiar uh with the work you know, done by Captain Gregorio Oka, right? Your father here. You, it, it's. I think it's important to to maybe elaborate a little bit on that, right? So we've had a webinar before uh, about the work that Amosud does, and and in the introduction, Elisenda already mentioned. So the uh, Seafarers Union in the Philippines is it's one of the largest actually by membership in the world, and and as we know. Uh, the Philippines is an important contributor to seafarers worldwide, right? So, so it's it's not an exaggeration if I say that the global shipping industry actually moves because of the Filipino seafarer, and it's then not an exaggeration to say that the work that Amosu does in their welfare plays a key role in that. So, so this is why it's really important, and now it it kind of answers a little bit. Uh, you know why you're here. Okay, so so I've given a hint as to why you've been here as one of the one of the reasons. So you played an influential role in actually shaping that, right? And so, but maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on you know the uh, from your side, from your perspective, right? Watching your father as uh, in your own words, no, from this thirty-seven meter square to today, what it is, no? A couple mm -hmm. of ships, so many training centers, so many lives, literally millions of lives influenced. Uh, so if you reflect on that, really what were the key milestones that you observed from your father and any leadership lessons that you've drawn from that? Later, we'll go into more of the work that Gold is doing uh, and, and some of the other key initiatives. But maybe let's stick right now to your uh, you know, your the influence you've had from your father and the leadership lessons you've taken from him. Uh, you know, my father, Captain Gregorio Oka, was, I believe, the, at the right place, at the right time, the correct circumstances in economics, you know, the Philippine uh, position uh, for seafarers at the time he started. So his work was really sort of, very trailblazing and I saw his grit I saw his tenacity 
And uh, of course, uh, he's, he, because of his hard work and already positioned because of his brother, Roberto, in the dock uh, workers uh, uh, labor movement, he, it was also uh, very natural for him to form a seafarers union. Uh, in the 70s, that's when a lot of ship owners or the very first ship owners uh, who trusted him and he told me that uh, it was Stolt Nielsen, Mr. Stolt Nielsen. And uh, the tankers, those tankers were the first to, to crew uh, Filipinos in, in most of their fleet. So he was very appreciative of uh, Mr. Stolt Nielsen at that time. And uh, the trust built, you know, even from among the other ship owners. And if you come, if you need to crew your ships with Filipinos, go talk to Captain Oka. So this was very early on. And so from that trust, he built, uh, he built more uh, credibility in um, making sure that Filipinos were taking care of the ships and uh, giving crew to, to the ship owners who trusted him. And uh, he, I think he played a very pivotal role in uh, to, to what uh, has happened to the maritime or manning industry in the Philippines at this point in time. And um, um, he was a very grateful man, very generous man. Uh, the leadership uh, that I saw in him was one of benevolence. He really had, he, he had told me, if you just have a good intention, that will bring you to so many things that you need to do or want to do for your seafarers. And so he, you start with a good intention and that's going to bring you to many things. He was also a great visionary. He was a captain, a ship captain, a licensed ship captain, but he wanted a hospital. He wanted dormitories. He wanted to run a school. He wanted to run, um, he wanted to run a, a housing development. He wanted everything in place for the seafarer because he believed that if you take care of the families of the seafarer, then you have a, a seafarer who is peaceful on board and can work well. Fantastic. So it's almost like, you know, listening to you, uh, he, he's going to some of the first principles of leadership, right? If I may say so, the fundamentals. So uh, nothing remarkable, but very, very important, Like, right? And we almost kind of ignore it, you know, building trust, right? And that trust then leads over many decades to what we see today, where the Filipino seafarer, uh, you know, takes pride in the industry, but also the employers take pride in having them, right? Which is mm -hmm. very difficult to achieve. And, and of course, it's taken time. Then this other point that you just mentioned, right? It's the good intention. And, and how many times we actually ignore that? The intention probably is, is stronger than the actual action, right? Mm -hmm. I, I did a workshop. And I'm, I'm digressing a little bit, but today is about leadership. It's also an, an area which is really close to my heart. I did a workshop for my team on communication, how to communicate better, etc. And I introduced a topic of nonviolent communication, NVC, right? And, and, and within that, one of the key things, the violence is not the physical act, but it's the intent that you have in your mind, right? Mm -hmm. so, so again, you can see the benevolence, the generosity. And at the end, it's it's the mind, right? The other point I'm picking up, and here I'm looking more from an entrepreneurial point of view. So when when you are really serious about solving or or improving the lives of seafarers, you're not thinking only about the job, which is of course very important. You're actually thinking about their lives in a holistic way. So so you're actually talking about things like the the healthcare needs, not only for them but for their family. Right. You, you mentioned about housing, etc. This is reflected today. That vision is basically what is coming out in, in the Seafarers Union. No? So in Amosu, uh, again, for listeners who are keen to know more about Amosu, we've had a webinar with the president of Amosu uh, when I was in the Philippines a few months ago. And, and that is really focused on Amosu itself, right? the activities that we are doing. 
So, so just a reference to that. Now back to you, Marisa. So, so thanks again for this. The topic today is about uh, tomorrow's leaders in maritime, right? And your your father has done wonderful because he created this tomorrow's leader. When you were four years old, he already brought you in in the leadership plan, and and you can see the impact, the multiplier effect is there. But now, one, tell us a little bit more first about the Gold Foundation. Uh, yeah, it's a leadership development foundation, and I haven't seen that many leadership development organizations, uh, you know, who have also a connection with maritime. So, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about your motivation to start Gold and and uh, uh, what it does. Well, uh, as I said, my uh, the 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 Gold Foundation is named after my father. Uh, we have seen, and some of us believe, that. Uh, his type of leadership is uh, something to uh, to perpetuate, and um, through the Gold Foundation, we're able to pe perpetuate the core values that he has shown in leading Amosuk to what it is now, and what uh, all of us are uh, are um, are um, uh, enjoying, uh, especially for the seafarers and their families. Uh, so we have the core values that we emulate from Captain Oka are uh, tenacity, integrity, and uh, excellence. And um, so the, we have an acronym for this. This is TIE, you know, T-I-E. So uh, leaders like Captain Oka have really, um, re he, they've, they've, uh, they rode the storms. There were so many um, challenges uh, throughout the decades that he had to um, um, uh, look into and issues regarding seafarer welfare. Uh, he looked into and um, connected with all the stakeholders to make sure that uh, within Amusuk we are able to address the needs and the and be instruments of making the dreams of our seafarers also come true. So um, basically, gold um, embodies these values of Captain Oka, and we try to extend or expand services to um, more seafarers in terms of um, being the gateway for knowledge, gateway for the, the um, programs, for leadership, for future maritime leaders. Um, we also realize and um, we also recognize that the importance of leadership in the families. And so we have w programs for our women champions who are aware of the issues, especially for the maritime issues that concern their seafarer loved ones. Um, Particularly, we have um, a program not right now for women, and uh, these are women uh, championing seafarer families. They could be employees of uh, agencies, manning agents, uh, anything, any office that's uh, related to maritime. And um, they are being made aware of their identities and their self, their uh, um, uh, self-awareness so that they also can um, connect with the issues, particularly the issue of ambulance chasing right now, so that they can also be able to lead other communities of women to action against the issues that beset our seafarers and um, that uh, cause um, cause trouble in some cases to families. Um, so, yes, yeah, so Marisa, you, you, you've explained very clearly you know, the motivation behind setting up gold. And again, your father has been a big influence. What you're doing is also uh, scaling that leadership you know, through this organization. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you yes because and and you're kind of leaving behind that legacy for future generations right so so 
thanks for explaining uh, you know what you're doing also some of the initiatives here i'm curious to know a little bit more uh, if you can uh, elaborate when you said that you know the seafarers family so whether they are agents or others connected with the maritime ecosystem i, I picked up on two things one is uh, championing the women in the family and and yeah. secondly then you mentioned also ambulance chasing uh, which is something i learned again when i went to the philippines you no know, recently but maybe first talk about why women and the identity of them inside a seafarer's family is critical uh you know anjan in my experience doing the seamen's hospital for 15 years and then eventually community development for amusu uh i cannot depart myself from dealing with families because they're the ones who are left left behind and the uh, the wives or the mothers of the seafarers are really a uh, uh, center of the management of a family whether the family will will uh will be successful relationships will be peaceful or otherwise right so i'm witness to that since i was little and since uh, i had started the i mean i had help in in building the hospitals um the families would be there the pregnant women would come over they would give birth at the seamen's hospitals they would sometimes give birth by themselves and then have to raise the family and then wait for their uh loved one to arrive and then for maybe two months of vacation then have to go back again on board etc i've seen this for about 45 years already and the issues of women be having to be empowered is very stark and we are happy that at this point in time um our stakeholders have taken attention to families i belong to one so i belong to a seafarer family generations of my family were seafarers also so um it 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 is about time it's been long delayed that we pay attention to the women and so at gold foundation we were able to seek um support for the for the um development of women their self awareness when we have conducted this uh, uh the women the initial women that we uh we took in for training you could you know there were tears and emotions were flying high because you know lots of aha moments happened in those training sessions and so we make them aware of themselves we uh, get them to see their core values and strengths as women in seafarer families and then bring them to the issues of maritime after which they can do their own action in their own communities where they live or work about uh, awareness for uh, issues that are um are happening that are negative for seafarers and families also yes, and, and one of them is the ambulance chasing uh, issue that's right. right so and, that's and i understand that you've done a lot of work there your foundation also you have yes. supported marina the maritime industry authority uh but not everyone may be familiar with ambulance chasing so again it's a great opportunity to get the voice out there on what is ambulance chasing and yes. maybe uh, and jan can you know changing somebody's lives as a result yes. of your work so and jan can you define ambulance chasing for me if you were <laughs> i didn't think you're going to put me on the spot yes so what i understood is the following right that uh, seafarers by definition i've been a seafarer myself you're you're traveling all over the world eh, right and things happen you now you need legal support let's say something goes wrong okay or not so wrong but you are on that ship where that incident happened 
Mm-hmm. And now you need legal support, but I didn't know of Amosup, let's say. And when I was sailing, I had no idea. We didn't have, I was not part of any union. So I'm, I'm under stress, right? And my family is under stress as well, because I communicate to them saying, you know, I'm not sure if my job will remain. I may be blacklisted. So there are these groups of people, uh, ambulance chasers, right? And you, you could have had an accident. It's a, that's why the ambulance also comes in, in my mm-hmm. view. So they come to you, they approach you as trying to help you, right? So there are these insurance people, there are these other brokers who will come to you and say, don't worry, I will handle everything. I will get the claim for you, sort it out, but pay me. This is my commission, right? Mm-hmm. And, and basically, the, the whole awareness program is, uh, you know, in most circumstances, you, you probably don't need to go down that route and, and basically give that massive chunk of brokerage fees, which is something of a birthright for you. And there are many other organizations like Amosoup, et cetera, who already cover those things for you. Correct. Right. So I don't know how well I did on a scale of zero to 10, but uh, I, I tried my best to answer what is ambulance chasing. Well, you did a 10.5 there, Anjan. <laughs> okay, uh, that's good. Ambulance chasing is when uh, uh, usually lawyers come to the rescue of a, uh, of a repatriated seafarer who might have gotten into an accident on board. And of course, this is a very stressful time for both the family and the seafarer because you don't know where you're going. And you put your trust in these errant lawyers and uh, they will eventually, at some point, uh, probably get 90% of the chunk of your claim at the end of the day. So. we there are many cases even while we were training the women one of the women's husbands uh, was approached got into an accident and was approached by by an ambulance chaser but he already knew because his wife was undergoing the training so they were aware not to really pay attention and go to the manning agency or go to the union as the case may be so there are the the you know the manning uh the crewing group here uh, seafarer organizations are very we are very organized as uh seafarer orga- it's a very organized um 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 everything is in place unlike maybe um uh, other OFWs um the seafarers uh, are very organized in the Philippines yeah. they're well taken care of no, thanks for explaining that. I think it's an important point. I'm glad we were able to cover it in the webinar because those who are not aware of what is ambulance chasing at least become aware from that. But you have tangible, right? You just explained a few examples. You illustrated of of wastage of resources that belongs to the family going to you know, someone with not the right intention, right? We oh, talked right. about intention earlier. So, uh, so thanks for sharing this. Uh, I want to shift the conversation a little bit and, and focus on future leaders and, and qualities of a future leader, especially in maritime. I also want to give a shout out. We are at the, oh, it's almost half an hour. Wow. The time has just passed. So, okay. We are at a point where I would welcome also questions from the audience, right? So, so remember, you can just type in your question on the chat and I'll, I'll be able to see that and I'll bring that in front of Marisa, okay? So please, uh, any questions you have on this topic, leadership, what what Marisa does, any other things also, don't don't worry about too much on the scope. Uh, it's my job to moderate, but I welcome that interaction from the audience, okay? So, so let's shift to how you see a future leader in this VUCA world. So the VUCA is known, right? volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. But we've added a D because it's also a digital world, right? And and that's really playing out, uh, you know, at various levels. So the VUCA world today uh, and going forward uh, requires a different preparation. And, and so what are you observing in, uh, you know, in the work that you're doing with families? Uh, you know, when, when I saw the copy for this webinar, 
vocal for me is a bit new. It's a quite uh, it's a new, but it's been here around for a few years now, right? Especially during the pandemic, it was was the uh, byword. Um, when I saw the uh, acronym and what it meant, I had a feeling that I'm I was already in this. I'm already in this. Uh, for a long, long time, I've been in this uh, in this situation of Vukad, um, doing doing work for their families and tells someone to be very intuitive. A lot of and since also Filipino families, we are very relational. So our 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 um, roles as uh, people who create or build and sustain all these programs need to, uh, we need to work on being clear all the time. Clarity of purpose for service all the time. We need to know why we're doing what we're doing. Um, uh, we also, I said, need to have a good intention, but uh, if you are a leader who is very adaptable and change is something that you live within, other people are very comfortable being in a zone where everything is okay and there's always a um, stopgap for things that, you know, an, a, a solution like from the books. Um, if you live in a world uh, that you like uh, uh, solutions that are already from the book, then I think VOCAD will really, will really shake you. So uh, if you have, you know, seafaring, it is such a, you know, even the environment of seafaring is already VUCAD, right? The seas are unpredictable. Uh, when you are in, in those waves, you don't know what the next moment will bring to you, right? So uh, if we, uh, we, we um, relate that to our work, um, running seafarer welfare programs, then we constantly adapt to change. Uh, it is something that um, you have to always seek a solution and use so many, I, 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 you know, I, iterate it so many ways for the solutions that are needed at that point in time. Um, leaders of the future have to be very adaptive, very clear. They have to be intuitive. They have to, to um, study nuances so that um, um, the services can really be the right services. Um, um, since you are in a digital world, and we are in a digital world, digitalization is quite... Um, quite uh, useful at, at this moment in time. Um, can we, we imagine something that we don't know in the future? We're actually not knowing um, the situation for seafarers for the future um, in, in the coming years uh, when automation is right, you know, in the forefront of issues also. Um, uh, we need to also be creative in the way we we uh, address um, job job security and the skills and uh, needed for future um, maritime maritime uh, needs. Um, shipping, I don't think shipping will be out of uh, fashion, it will be here forever. Uh, the trading of goods are going to be here forever and seafarers are very needed uh, forever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, so, so I think you've, you've, you've given a lot, I've been taking some vigorous notes, <laughs> you know, on, on some of the characteristics you mentioned of uh, you know, a future leader, especially in maritime. And you're absolutely right. You know, the maritime industry already prepares you. If you go on a ship, for example, no? it's, it's the uncertainty is something that you have to get comfortable with. The yes. leadership 
automatically is is kind of grown on you because you you see leaders of course there's a particular style of leadership there right and and uh, many times the leadership is about telling because uh, it's it's not necessarily you know consensus based opinion kind of okay what do you think should we go starboard or port you know when there's a man overboard <laughs> so so things like that so it it has a very specific context uh and and you know from my perspective what i'm seeing as as i've been on that side and then now that i lead a, an organization which is creating digital solutions for the maritime industry we are going into things like innovation right so which actually requires a very different leadership style it requires a style where you actually want everyone to to tell their perspectives you really don't know the answer so unlike a man over boat situation where you know you know whether you have to go right or left it, it's almost yeah you know a second reflex in this you have no clue as the leader what's the right answer and you need to be extremely comfortable with that right and then you have so much of signals coming from the market because of the digital world right we get so many notifications alerts people sending you, you know it's so easy to actually share information but you get an overload of that right so so that's why i find this topic very interesting and i always ask this to you know people uh, in the maritime who are who are actually shaping leaders how they are doing it and uh, uh, so so we'll we'll delve further into this okay i'm, I'm not going to uh, stop talking about this but i i also want to just involve the audience and i can see there are a number of questions that have already come in uh so let let me just take them as they've come and i'm not editing anything like so how you interpret this question it's from an anonymous attendee who says how are women championing funding their advocacy so how are yeah so women do you want to take this marisa Oh yes, particularly our training for women championing seafarer families. Yes, we were helped by the ITF Seafarers Trust okay. for for funding the training for women. And if I take this question and I interpret it as if there are other women who want to do initiatives, advocacy related initiatives, what what would be the channels you would recommend them to to come for funding or to to get funding? Oh um depends on uh, the flavor uh of uh, their their causes right so I, i guess you align you have to align with with your you have to align your cause with the cause of the funders too yeah mm -hmm. no thanks for that so uh there's another question and it's again on little bit what we were discussing earlier so uh, Uh, Joseph Contreras, who's basically asking the following, right? And I'm reading now. So it says, currently we are facing a very autocratic, authoritarian, and unempathetic leadership on board in many situations. Although yes. we know that the captain has overriding authority when making crucial decisions for the safety of the ship, crew, and environment, how can we improve the captain's image and help him understand that being kind and not instilling fear when one can voice their opinions or express their ideas uh he, he goes on to ask no how can we fulfill the directive of the captain uh in case of any doubt if he does not demonstrate an image of good leadership but rather one of fear based leadership it's a great oh, question yes it's a great, great question, question to joseph yes thank so you your thoughts first uh, uh yeah, thank you so much for that question joseph seems like he's a he's a, a seasoned seafarer um he also if i can guess he's a young seafarer yeah i'm going to look up uh, the registration to see more details on him but so i would advise that you observe your captain a lot because one day you know when you are the captain what not to be like So uh right now he is in command of the ship he is responsible remember he has all the responsibility for whatever happens to the ship so uh observe him uh be respectful 
be uh, be um, more understanding uh, unless it's to the point that you yourself are in danger. I think uh, you will learn a lot from observing the captain so that one day when you are the captain, you know not, uh, you know what not to be like. And uh, I'm happy. Yes, that so here, Marisa, I've, I've looked up the registration and uh, Joseph Contreras is a master mariner. So he's, he's indicated that he's a, he's a master. Okay. So, Wonderful. So yeah. he... Not so he sees he's talking on behalf of the industry, his peers, etc. And I and I and I completely agree with him in terms of the general norm of of you know, especially seasoned ship captains is really an authoritative, direct style, right? What I was describing earlier. And it's shaped because of the situation, the context, right? But what he's asking is how can we make those things, the safety of the ship and all that, of course, remains priority. But how can we have a, a more inclusive style of leadership in that situation? So any thoughts on that? Uh, if Joseph is a master, oh, any thoughts on making uh, the life on board more inclusive and more... Yes, yes. Uh, yes. More, yes. more uh, empathetic, yeah, so... Yes, empathetic and uh, more cordial, right? Exactly. Uh, I will go by the rule of don't do to others what you don't like others to do unto you. So I think you just have to be cordial to him uh, un unless he really um, compromises the safety of the ship. His character, his character is different from his skills. So let's just compartmentalize his skills on manning the ship or being able to command the ship versus his uh, character. Uh, one day he will come to it and maybe improve his uh, character. He's growing. I mean, this. The, uh, sometimes they are still in the process of growth, and one day they will come come around and be improved uh, masters also. Yes, absolutely. Good point that you've just mentioned, right? So again, I think what I how I would also add is based on your inputs is what you said earlier. It's the intent. So though you have to be directive in a situation that will save somebody's life as the master of the vessel, you don't have to be seen as someone who's not empathetic, right? So, so while in that moment you are saying, do this, and of course you say it in a way that nobody's required to ask you why, but on the other <laughs> hand, when, when that situation is slightly different and it's it's not just a moment, right? You you have many touch points with your crew. Then you show that you really care about them, right? So mm -hmm. if somebody is really having a bad day or is not in 100% for whatever reason, you are acknowledging that, right, as a leader. You're not just ignoring that, right? You're acknowledging that you may not be able to do anything about that. I'll, I'll give a real story for which from a... a uh, a colleague of mine who's a sailing master and he's still sailing right now and he called me I don't know why he called me but he was on the ship and he called me during COVID and and we started having a conversation and he said you know what my job has now become because people can't sign off we, we ask for vaccines and we don't get them right even uh, of course situation has changed a lot now but at that point basically what he was doing was the job of an empathetic leader he was telling about his second officer, whose mother had died of COVID and, and was not able to sign off. And, and just think of it. How, how, how can you make that person be the officer of the watch when he's yeah. going through this grieving, this uncertainty of when he can see? But here is the, the, the answer. No? The empathetic leader can't solve that problem, can't send that guy home but is willing to acknowledge that, okay, you're not at your 100% right now and you're not alone, right? So right. There, there are ways to do that. It's not easy, but uh, again, the intent, what I took away also from no, your, your wise father's uh, habits, the intent is, I think, much more important than the actual action. Mm. We've because got another will... question that's come. Yeah, please. Go ahead, um, go ahead. It will bring you to your, uh, to your joyful conclusion. At some point in time, just have a good intention. Perfect. So we've got a, I don't know what you've done, but there's plenty of questions coming in. <laughs> I hope we can keep up with all of them. I okay. hope I can so, answer them. 
so so okay so this is a comment uh, more than a question uh, and the comment again is from someone anonymous who's saying that actually a lot of seafarers don't know what is ambulance chasing and 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 he's also like curious how how are women championing this uh, spreading this idea so again so now we have actually explained what is ambulance chasing and the the role of the family member uh, and usually because right now the the women seafarers is a very tiny percentage so so again the work with the families usually involves the women uh, and and basically it's also to make that family aware that if a lawyer calls the family that you know you you want to be careful of that you first go to the manning agents or you go to uh, the seafarers union that you're part of right like an amasu etc so so we i think answered that question and then uh, again joseph contrera uh, is, is basically just elaborating on uh, you know i'm dedicated to conducting many ship condition inspections that encounter scenario so okay so he's a master mariner but he's not sailing he's actually going on inspections etc right so so glad that he asked this question i'm really happy that you know we are actually having a conversation with the with the attendees and that's that's beautiful so let me ask uh, a few more questions on different topics so let me bring them up to you marisa and and here's another one from another anonymous attendee so what advice would you give to other children of seafarers and young professionals of the maritime community example maritime students in in living thriving and making a difference in the community now another very good question right so so it's for the young professionals the students what advice do you have for them to thrive in this industry well if you had um you had come into a uh educate being educated or you are a student in maritime you already have that um that characteristic of tenacity because coming into a uh, world or a career for seafaring will mean that you are very 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 tenacious hard working and persevering because no one will want to come into a career in seafaring if you do not possess these characteristics aside from being a curious person and uh have a the love for adventure if you have been forced then think again because uh because if this is not the career for you do not get into it it is very taxing and very um it will require a lot of your of your mental strength actually um what advice can i give young people um uh, especially children of seafarers we need to be more understanding of the job of our fathers when the um i remember our your mothers or your fathers in the case of uh, women seafarers are balancing your family life with one parent away from home so as children sometimes uh, uh parents will um show their love for you by buying you everything and you know be, uh, providing you with what you want providing you with uh, uh the things that you see on social media that you think you need but really just want um uh, please be fair to your parents uh they work very hard because i'm sure their priority is for you to be educated very well and also to provide you food clothing and shelter so be appreciative of them and always um be um be um uh, respectful um don't take it against them that they are away from you because they're the first people who do not want to be away from you they want to be with you but circumstances dictate that we have to make a living for them to raise good children because their intention is good they they brought you out into the world we were brought out into the world as kids and uh they want you to have a good life and that's why they're on board ships 
Great. So again, there, there are one or two more questions which I will take uh, right away. I want to ask another question, again, related to the work that you're doing. Uh, so how are you measuring the impact of the work that you're doing? Um, well, what we can see is just more of more uh, the, the program we do now for women champions, we see them, uh, we measure them, of course, by in, in terms of how many women champions are going to be trained and how and then the impact they do in their com impact they are doing in their community are also measured uh, as as the program um, as the program um, moves forward. Um, we encourage them to um, be able to deliver the message and the information and the knowledge about the issues in maritime in their own in their own communities at work and at home but uh, by uh, by um, being able to to um, form also groups that will echo those uh, the knowledge about the issues that we take up in uh, WCSF is what we call it Women Championing Seafarer Families. The website, uh, the uh, the Facebook page. Please like that uh, Facebook page. We'd like you to follow so that you you can you can be more aware about what we we do in it. Um, the number of women leaders that are trained uh, so far is is how we measure the impact yeah. and what no, they fine. deliver to their own communities. No, thanks for sharing this because often you know it's it's a challenge to to measure the impact of a lot of these intangible things, right? How do you how do you measure that somebody's tenacity is increasing, etc. But I think you you've really addressed this. You have a multiplier effect, so you're you're actually looking at how many uh, women are affected here directly, and then you know how they are circulating this and and actually multiplying that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a comment here again on on and and basically saying thanks for you know, the WCSF initiatives that you're doing, right? And and kudos to that. So so again, congratulations. There's another question, uh, question comment again from, I, I think you know this lady, Edna Oro, and she's saying that uh, the wife of a seafarer, a master mariner, and the question she's asking is how can uh, she contribute to the welfare of seafarers globally? And then she's saying, okay, she's also been part of this uh, advocacy group to you know, help uh, promote the cause, to get the message across. Uh, so she's already doing in, uh, stuff to to help the seafarers. But are there any other ideas you have on well, how somebody you, somebody can contribute to uh, the welfare of seafarers globally, especially thank if it's you, a partner, if it's a wife? Yes. Thank you very much, Miss Edna, for uh, for uh, for that comment. Uh, you are most welcome to join WCSF. Just uh, connect with us on our Facebook page. Uh, our program uh, head there is Mr. Bien Galapon, uh, a graduate of MAAP, uh, taught in many other ways of leadership in the Gold Foundation and has, uh, has uh, led these uh, women to uh, be the sparks in their own communities. So if you would like to send us a message on our Facebook page, you're very welcome. You can help in so many ways, just in maybe writing, writing letters or uh, um, uh, championing women champions, championing women champions. And it's, right now, just the encouragement you've given me now, it's it's enough. I mean, I really, really appreciate that. There's actually more encouragement coming your way. I think you you're quite a popular person okay amongst lots of people so so there is also uh sherry jane salvador who's basically saying again you know and she's put different words here but basically she's saying you know kudos to the wcsf initiative which is a game changer and uh, you know it 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 shows how important this work is um there's a comment we we didn't go much into this topic 
because actually we've covered a little bit this topic in a different webinar also, which is about mental health of seafarers. So the comment again from Edna is, uh, you know, we have to also really pay attention to the mental health of seafarers and and absolutely, you know, this is yes. super important. So any we comments have, on that? Yeah. Yes, we have a program called Kamusta Kabaro, which deals with the mental health situation of the seafarers and also Kamusta Kadete. Because I, we believe that in the maritime schools, we really need to uh, address cadets' mental health situations also there. So, Kamusta Kabaro, Kamusta Kadete is our mental health arm uh, program. Right. Thanks again. Uh, also, the AMOSUP has this, no, for seafarers who are feeling alone, there is a helpline available and it's anonymous. You will get support. This is something, again, I learned. So, again, this webinar series is really to get some of these important messages out to a wider audience. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So, I'm, I'm again, this, is, this has been a great webinar because suddenly I watched the time and we are already 55 minutes into it and questions are still pouring in, okay? So, so uh, I'm going to take, again, some of those questions and, and maybe reframe them also. Uh, so we have uh, uh, Ruth uh, Lynn Esteban, who's saying thank you again to the Gold Foundation for all the work that you're doing, right? Thank and you then very we have much. a question. We have a question from Laura uh, Carvajal, uh, who's a close friend of uh, Navazaim. Actually, she's in another part of the globe. And, and basically, she's saying, uh, are you able to share an example of uh, women's strategy in your work environment? Uh, so, so how do you actually bring in you know, women in your work environment? So, I, I guess the way you want to interpret this question, yeah. This will be the last question that we are able to take right now. Uh, so, please go ahead. Uh, it, uh, strategy of women in the work environment. Um, uh, uh, I have always, uh, I have always respected women's um, the uh, women's ability to uh, solve problems in the home at work in government in the on the ship they always have a way of solving and bringing solutions to any issue um i think being women um we're born born leaders already because we have to lead our families uh into a direction that is uh, that is that is uh, of of peace, of calmness, discussing things, uh, um, uh, exchanging views in, in within the family. So we are already born leaders, and I think the the asset that we have being leaders in the family, we must um, uh, grow and we must enhance by gaining more knowledge by maybe being trained more, being uh, open to a lot of learning. We have to be lifelong learners as women. Uh, we also need to be, we also need to be um, the, our uh, nature of understanding things uh, have to come into play because I think uh, our, I, I, I really believe that um, the nucleus of society is the family. And if the woman in the family is able to be self-aware, is able to make all opinions come together to form a good, you know, a good goal within the family, I think that's going to be the start of making society be more progressive and more, uh, more kind, you know, like, like that. Uh, master mariner who needs to be more empathetic, and uh, I think that's the, what the what 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 uh, what we need right now. Good leaders, as Simon Sinek said, eat last, and I think good leaders like women we eat last. <laughs> so that's fantastic! Really wise words, uh, no? And th this conversation has been. Uh, very energizing and we can see that also from the audience activity again 
many other people just sending out thanks here, right? We have Erian Diaz basically saying really thank you. Uh, again, Ruth Lynn Esteban, which we saw again putting in more comments. So what we will do for you also, Marisa, is is actually give you those comments, right? We'll send that to you because you know it shows again the impact of your work. This is another measurement of the impact, right? So so again, thank you so much. One last question before we close, uh, and I want to respect the time here also for everyone who's joined us. So thank you uh, again for connecting with uh, Marisa and me and the work that we are doing uh, together, you know, to, to actually enhance lives in the maritime industry. So thank you, everyone. But last question, and these will be the words uh, with which we will close. So Marisa, any, any, anything that you want to say that probably I've not covered uh, any words of uh, advice on leadership or any other topic for the audience. Uh, so you have the last word and then I'm going to pass it to Elisenda. Like eating last. I have the yeah. last word. <laughs> well, Anjan, thank you so much for inviting me here. I, uh, it, it, it's been such a great honor. I am still shocked that you would have chosen me to come to your webinar series. But I really, really appreciate it. Uh, time to share what we do at the Gold Foundation. And uh, one hour might not be enough. And we shall continue all of these in all of our uh, uh, future training with women. Uh, we can, you know, uh, call from their comments and then continue those conversations in the future. Um, in uh, in in you know in, uh, in parting, I would just like to say you know maritime is such a noble uh, industry to be in. I am I am very privileged to be the daughter of a master, and uh, one who has also uh, proven that you can do anything, and if you do the hard thing, you can achieve anything. Um, he said. In the beginning, my father, when I asked him uh, way into his old age, I asked him, what is this all for? What struck me was when he said, because in the beginning, like there was nothing. He was in a 37 square meter office. And that was the beginning. So from nothing, he did the hard thing. We do the hard thing, and then we have something. So uh, in all of this, even if it is hard, we should always choose joy in what we do. So I think that's what I can say for, for the end of this, um, this talk. Anjan, thank you so much. To your team, uh, Elisanda, Tomas, thank you very much. And no, to thank all you those again. who listened. Thank you. To no, you. Thank you. We'll have this recording again available for everyone. And even those who were not able to, please also circulate it to your family members if that's going to be uh, you know, inspiring for them. Mm -hmm. This has certainly been very inspiring for me. And uh, uh, I've learned a lot, really. I can, I can second what Marisa is saying. The maritime industry is, is just so wonderful. It gives a lot. It, it is hard work. But anything that you really want to achieve in a big way requires that, right? So don't shy away from that, but do it joyfully, like Marisa has said, right? The intention, do not forget that, right? So really, we've learned a lot on this. It's, I'm also taking away the signal that there is an opportunity for a follow-up uh, you know, conversation in the future, because there's so much other things that I've got on the list which we did not touch, right? Like, how do you actually get inspired, et cetera, right? So we'll, we'll save that for the next time. Uh, but again, thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar. Thank you, Marisa, for making it happen. And, and congratulations again on the great work and clearly the impact that you're having. Okay, And I hope this hidden story that often, you know, Marisa uh, isn't uh, always out there, you know, in, in, the, in the press, et cetera. So... I was really happy when she said yes, that I'm the, because then the story of the Philippines seafaring history that, that sometimes is not captured directly from the source. So I'm really happy that I got that privilege 
to play a small part in that. So again, thank you, everyone. I'm going to pass it back to Elisenda for her closing remarks. Thank you, Anjan. And thanks again to Mizoka. Bye, Nolda. Melissa. Thank you. I'll be signing off. Thank, thank you, you, Anjan. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Elisenda. Pleasure thanks. meeting you. Uh, thanks to all the participants for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this session and found it inspiring. Before we say goodbye, we would like to remind you that we publish all of our events and news on LinkedIn. So please follow us to stay updated on our activities. We look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar. So see you soon and have a nice summer.